Hey everybody, welcome. This is Vicki Ronchetti with Show Dog Prep School. And tonight we're having a roundtable discussion on rare breeds. So I have myself, I have Dachshunds, which are the opposite of a rare breed. And I have Lauchen, which are a rare breed, but we're seeing them more and more. This is my good friend, Teresa Harper, and she has feral hounds. And then Sandra uh, Pratari. Is it is your last name Hickson or Pratari? My Pratari last name is Hickson, right. Okay. Uh, who has Dandy Dinmonts. And then we have Alexa, who is a first-time owner of an American Hairless Terrier. So we're going to get another perspective from someone who's pretty new to having a rare breed. And then Cat Roll, who's covered in Lao Chen, who also has Lao Chen. So let's just go around. Um, I'd love to, Teresa, we'll start with you and just um, introduce yourself, your breed, and just let, me, let us know how you started with this breed and why. So I have fair hounds, and I started with the breed in 1991, 1992, that era, 1992. And I got my first pharaoh hound a bit because I was in college and I wanted to get a dog that I could have with me at school. And I met this breed with a uh, called up a breeder that happened to live in the area. And I, I went in and I met this breed and I just fell in love. And for years and years, I just had the dogs as pets. I didn't show them. I didn't lure course. I didn't do anything, but have them as pets. And it wasn't until like 2008 that I actually got a show dog. So I had been in the breed a very long time before I, I went into the area of showing. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, that brings up an interesting point before we go on, just, you know, that you were lucky enough to find somebody with a rare breed fairly close to you, close enough for you to go and actually meet one. Right. Yeah. So I think and that's an issue sometimes of like, Oh, I'm really interested in this breed and I've read all about it and everything looks perfect. And it's like, where can I find, find one? <laughs> yeah, it was it was bizarre that I happened to find a pharaoh hound in College Station, Texas. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Sandra, how about you? Well, I actually my original breed was Akitas, um, and um, a little bit different than Dandies. Yeah, you think? <laughs> <laughs> right. What a um, jump! But I also met somebody locally, very close to me here in the Bay Area. Um, Betty Ann Stenmark, who's been breeding dandy since 1975, so almost 50 years. And I, it was not my intention to get a dandy. We just became friends. Um, mm -hmm. And she gave me my first dandy, um, the mousetrap. And um, <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I started showing them along with the Akitas. And I just, um, I was having a lot more fun with the dandies and a lot more success. Um, and not, I was having a lot of health issues with the Akitas, not because they're particularly <clears throat> unhealthy. I just had, it, oh, it, uh oh, uh oh, uh oh, she'll be back. Um, let's come back to her cat. How about you? Tell us how you, um, oh wait, hold on, hold on. Maybe she's back. You're back. <laughs> okay. I'm. I'm sorry. Um, I don't know what happened. Um, and can you see me? Yeah, you're frozen, but um, but we could still see your beautiful face and we can oh, hear you talking. Go. All right. Um, and it, again, it wasn't that they were particularly um, unhealthy. I just had really bad luck and I had I had much more fun with the dandies. And so I have had dandies have been breeding and showing dandies ever since. Yeah, I got to tell you, when I met your little Holly Berry, I was like, oh, I could actually have one of these. Yeah. I might I have know. to put her in my bag and too. take her home. <laughs> I, you know, everybody says that about her, too. So, <laughs> yeah, she's great. <laughs> she's a great ambassador for the breed. She is, very much. How about you, Kat? <laughs> okay. Um, I got my first Louchin 13 years ago. I met them as a groomer, and there was just something about appealed to me about their character that really stood out from other companion type dogs and i got my first one and i thought it'd be fun to try confirmation showing got a male because i didn't want to be obligated to breed well i ended up with a female 11 months later and now they've <laughs> taken over my life <laughs> now. Pretty much normal oh my god that's so amazing <laughs> 
So you hear other voices. I'm like, I think I see crackle. Um, no, <laughs> this is Ricochet. Oh, Ricochet. I'm really being obnoxious because she just figured out how to get on the furniture. So it's it's a brand new world that she can get up here now at will. The storm's there, right? Yes, the storm. Right and it's then I've got Randy. Oh, Randy's yeah. only one of my favorites. Oh, behind my head is Cricket. <laughs> she, she's a co-owned. She doesn't live with me full time. She's here to have her puppies. Yeah. Um, but you see, she's settled in like she belongs here. <laughs> so. So you really went to the dark side. I mean, you're covered in them. Oh, yes. Yeah. And this is, I mean, this is my couch. This is just life. You know, you know I sit down and they're all over me. <laughs> and then the fact that they hear strange voices just makes this very interesting. Oh, here comes Ember. Um, <laughs> You know, that they think they're trying to figure out where the people are because my computer doesn't usually make noise because I do everything on mute. So it doesn't get their attention. All right, Alexa, how about you? So you are a little bit different in that you are coming to this more as a new owner, someone who just had to do the legwork to find your breed, find a breeder, right? Tell us about the American Hairless and how how that was to, to find one and to get involved in a rare breed. Sure. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm in Texas, so there are actually quite a few AHTs here in Texas. Uh, they originated in the South, and so a lot of the breeders are down here. Um, so that that I kind of lucked out on. Um, I had a golden. I have an eight year old golden as well, and really have been looking for something that would help me a little more with my allergies. And I wanted a smaller dog, so this seemed like a really good fit in that way. What's interesting is that I know that you also breed rats, right? <laughs> I do. I do. Yeah, uh, back back there, I got a got a whole bunch of them. In the so background. how was it? So so were you able to meet quite a few or were you really like I know a lot of the times like people will contact me about Lao Chen and they've never even met one. Yeah. And, yeah. and the good thing about Lao Chen is like it cat can can correct me if she disagrees, but I, I feel like it's kind of hard to go wrong with them. Like they're pretty easy. Like you're not going to get in trouble with one. You know what I mean? Like, like somebody can get over, in over their head with a breed that, you know, is like a really big and powerful, or, or there's a lot of aggression back there. Or there's a lot without Chen, it's like, they're, kind of, you know, so I don't feel so much like, oh my God, you have to meet you know, a dozen of these before you make a decision. Yeah. But I mean, I, I have had people call me and be like, uh, I want to meet one, but where, you know, where do I start? Yeah. So uh, in my case, this, this is where I'm going to show my, um, uh, you know, my lack of experience because I did not meet an AHT before, before getting one. And uh -huh. I would definitely recommend, I mean, that you meet any breed that you want to get into. Um, you know, having had a, a golden before, that's also a pretty safe, you know, breed that it, it can be harder to, to go wrong with. Yeah. And so I think that I didn't, I, I didn't really do my homework adequately. And um, I, I love, I love my dog. Uh, I love Nebula, my HT. She's, she's a great dog, but, um, but I think that I probably should have tried harder and would and would say, if you're looking into a rare breed, do what you can. In the case of AHTs, um, one good thing is that uh, although they are somewhat rare, they're really just a, a hairless rat terrier. So what that means is that if you can find a rat terrier to meet, you're really going to see a lot of uh, the similarities as far as, you know, personality and yeah. energy level. And all that kind of thing is going to be very similar. So it wouldn't be too hard, you know, in the case of AHTs to to probably meet similar type dogs. You know? Yeah, I, I think you are a little bit, you know, I mean, it's not easy to go from a golden in terms of temperament to almost maybe anything else. I mean, they're, you know, when they're good, they're real good, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, mine's she's sweet. She's quiet. She, you know, the classic just wants to please. And, um, I, I did want, I did want something a little more challenging. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think, I think in, in my case, Nebula, my HD is going to be a, a great Perfect. dog for a great companion for many years, 
but uh, it has been a bit of a learning curve for sure. Yeah, I'll bet. Um, I, the next thing I want to talk about is sort of, uh, I want to start with Sandra, since you did go from Akita's, which is, uh, I think, a more common in terms of numbers breed sure. than the dandies. But how challenging do you think it is to go from a very, like I went from a breed that's very popular. You don't go to a dog show and there's no dachshunds entered. You just yeah. don't. I mean, there yeah. are always, it's not, you know, you're not dying to find majors. They're, they pop up all the time. How do you think it has been for you to go from a very, very, a breed that, you know, has decent numbers and there's quite a few of them to a rare breed? Well, the one thing that is difficult is is that it is difficult to find majors and it's difficult to find entries. Um, right. You know, we, we say we have to finish our dogs at regionals and nationals because, you know, here in Northern California, we are the only breeders. We have a couple more people that are interested now that have some of our dogs and and that's really good because we've been able to pull together and make points yeah um but i mean i can go i have gone a year or two years without going to an all breed show unless i have a special you know yeah. but then it's just me and i'm going to show in the group basically so it's very challenging um there are areas of the country where there are more of them there are more in the southeast um probably now than anywhere else um, the bastion of dandy dum was, um, you know, the New England and the and the Northeast, and there are very few up in that area anymore. Um, wow! So it can be really difficult um, finding points, just finding points, and getting people together. Yeah. Um, Teresa, you're nodding your head about going to regionals <laughs> to get majors. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, depending on, you know, there have been times in the Bay area where that, uh, I've been able to get majors, um, uh, Vicki's been there for me getting a major, um, that at, um, it even all be chose, but right now in the Bay area, myself and my co-breeder are pretty much the only people showing. Mm -hmm. Now yeah. there is another breeder in the area, but right now she's, she's just focused on other things and she hasn't been showing. So we picked up uh, one of our majors at um, our regional, which was up here in the fall for the 20 month old. Uh, but I think it's going to be next April when we have another regional before there's another major. Uh, in fact, right now, the only dogs entered in any of the local shows, if there's, if you're looking at barrel hound entries in the Bay area, it's me and my co-breeder. That's yeah. it. So I'm I'm actually have more singles on my young female than I actually need. And that's because, you know, I've been showing her despite the fact that I don't need any more singles. But I also want that opportunity to, you know, take her in the ring and spend yeah. time. And, you know, we only have to have four dogs to have a major. Right. That's but two. finding four, yeah. it, <laughs> yes, it's not you. nearly as bad <laughs> as with Dandy Dinrods. But yeah. you know, it can be challenging at times. And I know other, you know, Hannah's on online and she's run into the same problem that it, you know, she lives in a very different area of the country than I do, but she also has pharaoh hounds and has a hard time finding majors or had a hard time finding majors. Yeah. Kat, I feel like since I've only been in Lao Chen, so Cannoli is my first Lao Chen and she'll be mm -hmm. six next month. But I feel like when I got her, I mean, there was just a few people. Now there's quite oh, a few God. more people. I feel like the numbers are going up. Like, are you feeling that too? When Alexia got Beatrice, I mean, there were no majors. There was nobody in California. Yeah. And now it's nice to see that we actually have a West Coast population. Yeah. They were all concentrated over here before. But even now, it's like I'm finding more and more that the majors are more scattered around and not always hmm. in Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Whereas when I first started, it was like South Carolina and Georgia. That's where I was going all the time because that's where that was close to Donna who had, she could usually make majors with herself and her co-breeders. And that's where we were always going. Yeah. Now we, we do have more breeders. So we are a little bit more scattered around and, you know, we've got, of course, I've got enough that I can almost make my own major now. <laughs> so, you know, that's nice. I can, enter and, you know, um, Lexi, another breeder, lives like seven hours south of me. So she usually has at least two. I usually have at least two. So there you go. That's the major. Yeah. So. Um, also, you know, what's interesting is that when right about the time I started showing cannoli, 
it was like all of a sudden Meredith was just this person in Sacramento yeah. who had Lao Chins, but never showed them because no one ever had them. So right. she was like this person who had bred a litter, you know, she had a couple and she ended up bringing out her dogs and, and yeah. showing them and finishing them. And now she's moving yeah. forward to the breed, but yeah. it was like, you know, it took that little bit of networking for her to be like, Oh, like people have, the, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like she's had them for years, but it's like, until she like found out that, um, you know, that some other people had them and we're going to be going to shows mm -hmm. like she didn't I think even know. Social media has helped everyone connect more too. I think and so too. Meredith has been in the breed longer than me, but I didn't know who she was. Yeah. So, you know, so now it's nice that we can see each other's dogs and we can connect with people across the country. And exactly. Maybe see each other once a year, but you know, you get to know people and their dogs through the internet. Right. And I think that, um, like your website cat and then also your facebook page because your photos are so great and you do the coloring with the dogs which i think gets people really excited but do you guys feel like um like i feel like so many of our dogs certainly the lao chin you know just all of a sudden having them in the grooming shop right and people come in yes. they're like what the hell is that yes. <laughs> what happened to that dog's pants you know <laughs> there but the, people will come in and they'll be like these dogs are so sweet i never even knew they existed yeah. so i feel like and i don't know if you guys feel like this you know yeah it's great i want to show them and stuff but even people who are willing to have them and just educate about them, even if they don't necessarily want to breed them. I mean, I think yeah, that's I've really helpful. Pet owners that carry business cards around that just explain what the breed is. Yeah. Yeah, you know, because people ask them when they're out and about. Most of these dogs are not in the breed cut. They're just in a simple pet trim. Yeah. Like one length all over, you know, just typical what you would see like, like this. Ember, thank you for demonstrating. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, their personality our engages <laughs> and they do ask questions so yeah it's nice for people instead of sitting there trying to spell out the name of the breed they actually carry cards so that they can let people know what it is that's so super great so what Our we see club actually has a little business side business card mm -hmm. size fold overs that you know you can hand out and i love that our yeah. club actually it, it, i think you know, we need to do something a little like bit that. about the breed and gives the breed club contact information and, and they're great they're great yes. Yeah. yeah, because it's it's kind of the same thing. You know, we we have six and we walk them in the neighborhood, me and my husband, and we walk them all together and we stop traffic. I mean, cars will literally stop and people meet them. And it's like what they think they're docks and mixes most of the time. But, <laughs> um, but but it's true. Then you explain to them and 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 you're you know, when you sell those companion puppies out there and those people are out there with your dogs and they're wonderful and sweet and friendly, you know, mm -hmm. they sell more dogs for us than almost anything else. Yes. And yeah. we have pet people that do therapy and do absolutely, stuff, you know, and people so, in their so neighborhood get to know their dogs. Yeah. So what, what was that, Teresa? Is, so we, what we see in Fair Hounds is a little bit different. So we see a lot of people that see a picture of a pharaoh hound and if you've never seen one google it and you'll see <laughs> one and they go oh they're absolutely the most elegant looking dogs they're wonderful they're beautiful they're gorgeous but they know nothing about what living with them is like and living with pharaoh hounds is not for the faint of heart i mean mm -hmm. they are avid hunters and they um they bark and they are they're obnoxious and they can be aloof and we really recommend that when people start talking about being interested in a feral hound, we want them to come out and see them at shows. I had a, a woman recently that came out and saw them at the show, came to my house, and then I'm going to take her out uh, open fielding um, because I want her to fully understand what this breed is. And she's actually hooked her up with um with with Hannah, who's on the call because you know Hannah's Hannah's planning a litter. Yeah, see a pic of a pharaoh hound, so graceful. Actual experience of a pharaoh hound. Is this a trash eating raccoon in a dog body? Yeah. <laughs> so I come home on a regular basis and find dead things in my house. Oh, see, like that's wild to me. Like one of my, you know, uh like crush breeds that like I'm in love with but I'll never have is like a big gigantic white male bull terrier. You know, but then a friend showed me like her bull terrier's bowls. Like their metal bowls are just all chewed up and bent up. I mean, it's like, you know, 
I have the breeds I have because I want to sit around <laughs> and just hang out with my dogs. But I love like that. Also, my breeds are very versatile, so they'll do something with me, you know, but I don't have to go hike with them for, you know, half the day, which I think is, you know, that's like a part of the issue is that people get interested in a breed. Sometimes maybe they see a picture of a feral hound. I know there's a few people who are here with Chernecos too, mm -hmm. which is probably like the, the version <laughs> of that uh sight hound short haired red dog that I could probably cope with and live with because maybe it's not quite as intense. But I think that you know this is important because these are the questions that people have. And even if like you want to go to a dog show to try and meet the dogs, if there's none entered, that's you're not going to meet them there. You know, yeah, we, we end up trying to hook people up. You know, people will contact me on a regular basis. Uh and I try and find them somebody in the area they're living in. Um, yeah, someone just posted, Abethans are so similar too, not for the faint of heart. Yeah, yeah. I show Abethans for some friends as well. Same deal. You know, just they look very elegant, but they are such a hardcore hunting breed that you got to be prepared to live with that prey drive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be tough for me. We, I mean, we have it too, to an extent. And and you know people meet dandies and you meet them and they are sweet and they love people and they love children and they have you know their nice little top knot and their big eyes and you know they'll lick you and kick but they are terriers you should <laughs> just post a picture of one hanging from a tug or something that was your holly berry well, <laughs> i'm like wow that's not the little sweet pea i saw a few weeks ago right so you know she has her little sweet pea side of her and then she has her terrier side of her and you know you have to be a little bit prepared for that because that kind of stuff is hardwired in you know if there's a mouse in the wall there mm. might be a hole in the wall too maybe yeah. so you know you so I want to, I want to kind of go around and get everybody's thoughts on this. Um, but I want to know, maybe we'll start with Kat. I, I want to know if you guys feel like, you know, if you're going to have a breed that is different and that is rare, like, do you feel like you have to be kind of the type of person who wants to talk about your dogs and willing yep. to talk about it and want to share it? Right. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. When, you know, people ask, well, what's that? You know, and you say the breed and they go, well, what's that? You know, part of being a rare breed, you know, you need to be able to talk to people about it because that helps our breed. Yeah. And you yeah. know, what's really funny is that, I mean, of course, uh, like cannoli is almost all white, right? So she looks like a white dog. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if I'm walking down the street with her, people are just going to think she's a multi poo. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what she looks like, a little white curly dog that I cut all her hair one length. And, you know, she just looks adorable, but she doesn't look like, holy crap, what kind of dog is that? So, like, I'll get more, oh, you know, is that is that a multi-poo or is that a, you know, a Maltese mix? And then I get to explain that it isn't, you know. Um, but I feel like that's sort of one of our jobs as ambassadors for mm -hmm. these breeds is to... Uh, you know, be wanting to talk to it. I know Kat does a lot of meet the breeds. Does anybody else do that? Say Lao yeah. Chen, people go, that's a mix of what and what. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I've done meet the breeds, had... but I will say that my two older dogs are not the kind of dogs that would, you know, enjoy meet the breeds. Now, the youngest one, like I could take her to a meet the breeds event and she would be on for it all day, every day. Yeah. You know what? That's a really good point. Cause Angie just said, um, the, cause she has a Picard as well as Lao Chen. She said the first few people I contacted about Picard said their dogs aren't meeting dogs and it was hard <laughs> to find someone to meet cause they're aloof. Right. So maybe people would be like, I don't even know if you want to meet my dog. I mean, cause it, you know what I mean? It's like, if you want to go meet this dog, but maybe that's what people need to see is that, yeah, yeah you come yeah, over right. and you can see them ignore you <laughs> and walk away. <laughs> yeah, come on over. You're going to be covered with 10 dogs. Like. Right. Exactly. No. So, no. They, they, they would be just like this if they was a total stranger sitting here. <laughs> they don't care. They're, exactly. Somebody yeah. that's going to pay attention oh, to them, it's all good. Say if that you know, again, Alexa. 
if you have a more aloof or shy dog, though, it, it can be hard to sort of get across what living with that dog is like, because yeah. the way that my dog interacts with me, me or my family is very different than the way she will interact with a stranger, you know? So if they come to meet and say hi, they may end up thinking, wow, this is kind of a, a dog that maybe doesn't like people. Whereas here in the house, you know, she wants to be with us all the time and play with us. It's just a very different experience, you know? I th think for a while it was really hard for me because I did have just two dogs that were not super into other people. It's not like they dislike people, but you'd come to the house and they'd be like, they'd circle you. They wouldn't be in your face until you, they'd been around you for a while. And now I have exactly the opposite. You know, I, people come to my house now to visit the dogs and we've got two that are like, yeah, I don't know if I like you yet. And one who's barking her head off. And then we have one that's pretty much trying to crawl in their lap to be part, you know, become one with their body. <laughs> what do your girls weigh, Teresa? I mean, like, what does Zephyr weigh? So the two, uh, the two older ones are 22 inches tall at the shoulder and weigh 40 pounds. Zephyr is 24 inches at the shoulder and weighs about 52 pounds. And what does Rocky weigh? Rocky is 25 and a half inches at the shoulder and weighs about 60 pounds. So I got to tell you, like, I went to Teresa to my first low coursing event. Like I've done fast cat events and, and like cat and I do field trials with my dachshunds and I've done earth dog with the dachshunds. So I went with her to that and you know, it is very like, Oh my gosh, I wish I had a kind of, you know, like in my head, I didn't say this out loud to Teresa <laughs> saying it out loud to her now. Oh, I kind of wish I had a dog that I could do this. It looks like so much fun until I saw her, co-owner wrestled that Rocky to the start line. Like it took two people to hold him back. And, and he is tall, but I, you know, I, I wouldn't even have guessed that he weighed 60 pounds. And I thought, oh my God, like that would just wrench my, like there's, it just hurt my back even seeing that whole display. Even and it's like, man, these dogs are not playing when they really want something. So even though they look all elegant and light, like if they want to really go after something like, it's going to be hard pressed to keep them back. We have before handed off dogs that weighed 40 pounds to people that are used, you know, at coursing events that are used to Irish wolfhounds. And they've been pulled off their feet by a 40 pound female feral hound because they are that strong. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty intense. Um, so I wanted to talk real quick because there's an, some sort of article that's been going around and it talks about Lao Chen, uh, it's $10,000 to get one of these dogs. And it's like, um, no, it's, not. I mean, I don't know where they did the research for this, but there seems to be this like thing that like, you know, you, you can't have a rare breed because one, you'll never find one. And two, it would be so expensive that you'll just never be able to have one. So let's talk about that. Let's just talk about finding one of your breed and the cost of having one of your breeds. So you want to start, Sandra? Sure. Um, you know, it, it varies. Um, they're not $10,000. <laughs> um, but, but it, it varies. I mean, a companion puppy is, you know, 2,500 to 3,500. You know, a show puppy is, you know, six or 7,000. Um, certainly, you know, we've worked out arrangements with people when, you know, they want to do something else. Like, um, you know, we have people who like to whelp litters for us. And so we'll work out something that way. And we love them because, yeah. you know, they're a great companion home and, and they'll show the dog and breed the dog. But, but, they're happy to help. They don't want to place puppies. And so yeah. we're happy to take them back and, and do that part for them. Um, so, you know, you know, but if somebody just wants a companion puppy, they're not $10,000, not even close. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 That's, I mean, the, what the range that you said, uh, I would say, I mean, my experience for Lao Chen is now I would say like around two or 2,500. Do you think that sounds about right, Kat? Yeah, I mean, there's a couple that are a little bit less, and there's some people that charge more. I've heard of prices going up to like forty five hundred, um, but my prices are twenty five hundred, and I know that's pretty typical for the breed. And yeah. you know, and that's show or pet. 
most of us charge the same no matter what. Obviously, the contract's very different for a show dog. For a show mm -hmm. dog, we usually do co-owns and we want a puppy back and that kind yeah. of thing. So, um, but no, we want our prices to be right in that range where well-bred dogs are. We do not want money to be the reason that somebody chooses a more popular breed right. over yeah. a chin. Sure. I mean, we, so we want to keep that price in, even though most of, you know, when people ask me our price, they're always, always surprised it's so low. And it's like, no, that's what it should be. Yes, we could charge more. Yeah. I'm sure we could, but that's not the point. And, you know, we want them accessible as it is. People usually have a pretty long wait. Our wait lists tend to be long and we have small litters. So yeah, you know, it, it can be a little difficult to find a puppy. Uh, especially if you're looking for show, you know, because when breeders are having litters of two or three, well, chances are the breeder's keeping one. Chances are there's a stud owner or somebody else wanting one. So it can be a little harder to get a show puppy. Yeah, exactly. So, but for pets, it's usually not that bad. And we all work together. You know, I was just a part of transporting two puppies from California here because there were homes here on the East coast and the breeder was on the West coast and we happened to be over there for specialty. So it's like, okay, you know, <laughs> three different breeders to get them over here. One transported them, her and Van. Then I went down to her house <laughs> come up along my show dogs and brought them here. And one, I was already gone home. One will go home next weekend, but yeah, you know, it's just, we all work together to try to make sure that people can get a pet. And, you know, one of these is pet. The other's performance, maybe show. We'll see. Yeah. I think sparrow hounds fall kind of in the middle between the Lauchen and the and the dandies. Um, you can get pharaoh hounds from about I don't know eighteen hundred dollars to I've heard as high as four thousand. Um, we do tend to as breeders be you know there aren't a lot of pharaoh hounds born in the U.S. or registered each year. It's ranges you know forty to eighty uh, registered per year in the U.S. Um, and you know, it can be hard to get one just because there aren't a huge number of them, but we actually tend to co-breed all females. Uh, we're trying very hard to keep, we've had a few instances of people getting, you know, males and females and then kind of indiscriminately breeding. And then our very small rescue organization associated with our purebred club ends up picking up all the pieces. And so most of the breeders co-own all females. Mm. And, unless they're spayed. And that's the yeah. same. recommend spaying or neutering a pharaoh hound until they're two years old because of their growth plates. And most people that have even pet pharaoh hounds get involved in either running or letting their dogs run in lure coursing. And so we want to make sure that they have an opportunity to fully mature. Yeah. Alexa, what's your experience with um, uh, finding and like... Uh, researching and cost and stuff like in terms of the American hairless was it like a big range was it more than you expected or like off the charts compared to your golden no no it was similar to my golden similar to what you said for Lauchen I think somewhere in the two to three thousand yeah. range is pretty typical I mean I'm sure it varies somewhat but yeah but I think it's pretty <laughs> So I wanted to touch on something Kat said. So this this is just something that you guys can um, just tell me your thoughts on because I don't know if it's true. But, you know, when I, um, you know, Kat was breeding dachshunds, I had a very, you know, I was taught and mentored and had pretty clear formulas. It was like line breed, line breed, go out, come back, line breed, line breed. And then when I got Lauchens, it's like, well, they're all so closely related right a little bit further back that you have to be careful with that. So I know that in Dachshunds, when we would do a lot of line breeding or if people got really close, that you would see that people would lose litter size and lose actual substance and size within their the dogs that they were producing. Cat and everybody else, because I don't know the size litters, that um, the dandies have, but I know Teresa's have been not very big for the size of the dogs. Do you guys think that that has anything to do with it? Like, do you think that we have smaller litters because that we have a small gene pool? I, I believe that our um, inbreeding coefficient is a huge part of why we have small litters. And just a guess, but I do think that we are all too closely related. And that's why, you know, we've been trying to back people getting imports and yeah, trying to bring in diversity and, 
you know, I love my lines and want to stay in my lines. You know, that's part of why I bought Skittles from you. She's out of Australian stud. She's out of a litter of five. There's some familiarity in her damn line, but for the most part, she's an outcross. So I thought, okay, maybe this can add something to my program. You know, we've got, you know, not living here, but we supported another breeder bringing in a dog from Russia. Got cool again that's from Sweden, you know, trying to get other things in because I do think that's what's happened to our litter size. I mean, we got when we do embark, our um, COIs are usually in the 30%, mm -hmm. which is really high. So, yeah. you know, and that, and even when you look at our pedigrees, you know, you see so many of the same dogs behind so much of our stuff. Even if you're going back, you know, I wouldn't call it line breeding and that we're not breeding necessarily like grandfather to a cousin or right. yeah, we're not doing like Brickett's formula a lot. We're not doing those kinds of things. But when you really look at the pedigrees, you if you go for five generations back, you're going back the same dogs over yeah. and, and over yeah. and over, you know, um, and that's, I think a problem, you know? Yeah. So I, you know, that's where we are trying to work on it. You know, it's, it's hard because you don't necessarily like what you get with the imports on everything. And, you know, there's, and it's expensive. That, I yeah, mean, it's expensive, expensive. to yeah. buy and then keep and yes. how, you know, these dogs that, especially if you get a male, like, of course I love Jaeger, you know, he's never going anywhere, but yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be able to bring in like, right three more males from different right. countries and then all have them live here for right. their life. You know what I right. mean? It becomes right. like a lot. Sandra, what's your experience in your breed with that? Well, with I mean, size and stuff. certainly about 20 or 25 years ago, Betty Ann went to Australia and found a line of dogs um, that she loved. And, and she was having a real problem with, with litter size and, overall health of puppies, you know, and just losing them. Um, and fortunately, when when we brought over frozen semen, not dogs, but frozen, um, you know, it clicked and we were kind of off to the races. And it's really difficult because you want to maintain type and your your type. And we're really proud right. of the fact that people tell us they can spot a King's Mountain dog anywhere in the world. And, you know, that's a good thing. But <laughs> with that comes challenges. Um, and again, we've been really lucky in that, you know, with the Australian dogs and now some dogs in Finland that are phenotypically similar to ours, um, we've been able to pull in some other stuff. But it's it's a dilemma um, because you're right. Sometimes when you do these outcrosses, you're not always happy with what you get. Right. Um, right. You know, we'll try and do what I call sometimes half outcrosses where somebody else has bred one of your dogs to something out and you'll pull in from that so it's kind of like a half out cross and you're bringing in something new but you're still yeah. hopefully maintaining that type that you work so hard to achieve and there just isn't a lot to choose from in our breed i mean there just isn't yeah. right yeah. I mean, we have very little to choose from when we go to look at studs and like okay yeah. you know that like three girls I'm trying to plan letters for them. It's like, okay, well, if I don't want to go back to this stud and I don't want to go back to that stud, it's like, there's nothing there. Better, better buy another one from another yeah. dog. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Vicky, you, you mentioned my two litters, which neither one was particularly big. I don't think that was due to, um, you know, due to line breeding. I think that was, you know, to be honest, in both those cases, for various reasons, we, we only got two breedings with the male um long stories but you know whatever one of the litters was six and one was four but we lost a puppy in each litter mm. now in feral hounds there are you know very distinct lines of dogs that you can differentiate when you see them and i mean vicky's seen a couple of the lines here in california and they are very very different um and the hardest thing that I find is finding a male that is not so closely related to what you have, but still maintains the you look know, you want, -ish, the look right? you want, and the movement you want, which is so critical for feral hounds. Uh, we have a we have a huge problem in feral hounds with um, 
you know, just incredibly poor front assemblies. And so, you know, you'll see dogs that are incredibly straight in the front and that's, that's not correct at all. Um, and so it's, it becomes this little game of, okay, well, I want to find a male and I need to stay away from, you know, my own line somewhat. So we end up doing the same thing. This last litter I had is I did exactly what Sandra was talking about, where I found a half outcross. Mm -hmm. You know, it goes back on one side to the line I have, but the other side's a complete, a complete separate mm -hmm. line of dogs. And that's what Skittles is. I mean, that's exactly what she is because mm -hmm. Vicky's cannoli, her foundation goes back to the foundation of my foundation girl. So those two lines are very similar, even though I bred generations down as Vicky has. So we're not directly related, but then the sire yeah. is an Australian import that's totally different. So. Mm -hmm. And and Mary's father is English. <laughs> right, right. So there's that, you know, so yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I am going to get, uh, you know, I'm working on doing like a talk on uh, genetics. It, Angie, who's probably on here, and her husband um, are, mm -hmm. you know, very into genetics. And then Teresa, I know, is. So um, hopefully we'll be able to do that talk. But I wanted to kind of wrap up with this last topic, which I think is so important. Um, I think it's so much... It's so critical in all breeds, but especially in rare breeds, that the community has to work together, right? Like, yes. like we have to share and we have to yes. um, maybe work with people who we uh, are a good fit for their stud dog or breeding with them. But maybe it's not even like, you know, somebody that you would be really close friends with or I don't know. I just feel like we have to go above and beyond to share and to work together and to be open and talk about issues we're having. So let's talk about that a little bit. Whoever wants to, whoever wants to start. Uh, so I, there were a lot of, you know, Farrah hounds are a, a, a reasonably tight community of people. We're connected to people all over the world. Uh, for the most part, you know, I enjoy all of those people for exactly who they are. Now, having said that, there are people that I'm like, you know, okay, do I want to have a long-term relationship with this person? And I, I think there is a certain amount of, you know, you you have to make sure that you can have a good working relationship with the person. And if you really don't feel like you can, it's probably not a great plan. Having said that, there are very few people that I have met in feral hounds that I'm like, I don't know if I could have a long-term relationship with them. There are very few of them. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, but there, there are a couple that I just, you know, I, I differ so much in my views of how things should be done that I'm just like, you know, I don't really think I could work with that person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, and it comes to a place also as that I, you know, as, as Vicky knows, because she's complaining because I'm still in my office, I, I have a, a pretty demanding job and I deal with a lot of really challenging people at work and I don't want to do that in my, <laughs> in my life. I, I want to keep the rest of my life with people that I really love and appreciate and there's several of them, uh, you know, on the, on the, uh, they have joined the, the call, you know, and, and yeah. You know, I just I feel like that that's a need for me personally in order to maintain my personal life and and my and some sanity of, <laughs> of, of what I'm what I'm doing. Yeah, and you know, I I agree with that. I mean, as in all walks of life, you know, just as in in dogs as well, there are going to be people that you can deal with, and there are going to be people that you can't, and and that's just the way it is. And you. You know, you try your best to get along with everyone. I, the, the Dandy Club has made a real concerted effort to, um, they, they started the Strategic Advisory Committee, and that advisory committee was formed to do nothing more than to make the public aware of the Dandy, but we've been very successful there. Where we haven't been successful is providing enough dogs <laughs> for... <laughs> <laughs> for the people that want them. So, you know, their, their part two goal is to um, bring in breeders. And we do have some young people coming in um, and, and lots of breeders who are looking at a dandy as a second breed. Um, 
And Doug Johnson, I'm sure who you all know, who has four very rare breeds, did a talk um, and, and said something along the lines of, if you have a more popular breed, then please consider getting you know, a rare breed and being a yeah. guardian of this breed. And I'm really encouraged everybody to do that. And we have a young lady who got a dandy because she heard that talk. So oh, nice. um, yeah, it was really, it, it, it was good. So, you know, I, I think, I think although you, you're not going to get along with everybody, you do have to try to work with everybody on some level because yeah. our breed communities are small. Yeah. Um, so, so we have to work with everybody on some level. Knowing, At least in terms you know, of like, let's tell each other what shows we're going to and let, you know. That, that, that's a thing. problem. That is a problem. <laughs> let's share at least. Let's start sharing there. That would be good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and I want to, I want to give a small shout out to Hannah who's, who's on the, on the, on the line here. You know, I mean, we been really lucky in the last few years in pharaohs to attract some people to the breed that are very conscientious and very interested in the breed and understand the breed and are really want to carry forward uh you know her mentors who's uh, not me but someone else her mentors line and you know that's right. super important and you know not everyone is going to be a great advocate for the breed. And there are some people that are gonna be great advocates for the breed that you don't like. And some people that are gonna be great advocates for the breed that you do like. And you know, you just gotta take that for what it's for what it is. And it, and embrace all of it. I'm gonna show this from Angie because I wanna give the same shout out to Angie. So Angie's daughter, Una, when she was almost 12, got a Lauchen from me for my first litter, that's CC. Um, but her parents are scientists. <laughs> they're very into genetics and they're very into their animals and their dogs. Um, and a for Angie, it was a big deal to preserve a breed. Like once she learned about how rare they are, like just from coming and talking to me and then being so involved with her daughter showing that she got one <laughs> and now she's going to be a breeder of Lauchen and, and Part of that is because of the importance of wanting to preserve something that's like actually endangered. Like I think things are much better than they were, but a few years ago in Lauchen, they were saying like in 2040, they would be gone. Wasn't right. that what it was, Kat? Like if yeah, somebody that's doesn't do something. We started breeding. I mean, it was like, these dogs are just too nice. We can't just sit back and I was like, I didn't really exactly. want to be a breeder. And then it was like, okay, well we have to, and then it just kind of took over our lives. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's the thing too, you know, it's like, even like with Money Penny, I mean, I'm going, well, I don't really want a puppy, but she's mm -hmm. chick health tested. She's got a fabulous temperament. She's a beautiful dog. She's got seven points. She's got a five point major out of the bread by class. Yeah, like someone deserves to have a baby for her. Right, right. You know what I mean? Like more puppies. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So I do think well, I keep um, getting more girls. And <laughs> yeah, and I normally, you know, I used to be very much of the mindset that I don't breed unless I'm keeping anything, and now I'm like, no. If I've got a fabulous dog yeah. and there's people who are interested, then like this is something I should do. And rare breeds. You owe it to your breed to you owe it to your breed to place good ones with other people. Mm -hmm. Because yes. that's the only way the breed's gonna grow and survive. You can't I we can't I can't keep everything. Nobody can keep everything. But if you have a beautiful yeah. bitch like that, yes, she should be bred. And even if you don't keep something, place those puppies with people who will do something with them. Mm hmm Yep. Yeah, exactly. Somebody, uh, Anita said, I'm going to share this quote because I think it's really nice. My next door neighbor wanted a smallish breed and was going to purchase a cavadoodle until I got involved. <laughs> Good job, Anita. I contacted a couple of breeders and they now own and love a Lauchen. It's awesome. Um, yeah. I want these little designer dogs. This is what they want. Yeah. You just don't know it. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and we love it. We love it when people and and like it, you know, people will ask me about Lauchen and it's like, you know how you're supposed to say like the not so good things about the breed. It's like, well, they can be loud mouth sometimes. I mean, that's annoying. But, you know, like other than that, like they're pretty great. I have a lot of bad things to say about them. You know, you're not going to get in trouble with one no, for the most part. No, you're you know? going to adapt themselves to most families. Yeah, exactly. 
So anything anybody wants to add about your breeds, about would, your club, anything? I would say that if you are interested in a rare breed and you're not able to get people to contact you back or um, and you're able to, you know, first breeder you contact doesn't actually reach back out to you, like be persistent. Yes. Yes. Be very persistent, you know, and write an email or call the person, but give them a lot of information about you and why you're interested in the breed. And like, maybe not just, hi, do you have any puppies? How much? Yeah, exactly. Don't write that email. Tell me something about you and what, uh, what makes you interested in X breed. And like, I will spend all the time in the world like introducing you to my dogs, letting you come to my house, inviting you to go do things. Even if I'm not planning on having puppies, I will help you find a breeder that is planning yes. on having yes. puppies. Yes. But you have to find the people in that breed that are interested in being advocates for the breed. And that's yes. not everybody. Yeah. Because that's those people, those up. are the people that will respond to you because they do want to be an advocate for their breed and they don't want you going off and getting something else. If you're truly interested in this breed. Yeah. Or we want you to learn if it's not the right breed for you. Yeah, that's you know? <laughs> like that's important too. Like if this is really not like when, you know, if I was like, I want to get a fair round cause I want to do lower coursing. And then I see Rocky, you know, almost pull, Greg over it's like yeah not for me I think it's that's important too that they're also getting like the um the information like accurate information sure you know there have been times when I've recommended other sight boundaries <clears throat> I suggested, yeah. hey, you know, given your lifestyle and where you where you are and what you're talking about you know maybe you should talk to some whippet people yeah. You know, maybe that's the breed you want it's not a rare breed but maybe that's the breed that fits in better with your life and so I think it's also important just to be an advocate for purebred dog ownership. Yes. Yeah. And I don't, somebody just posted the other day and said, you know, that they have a loud chin and like, you know, yes, we colored his hair and, you know, we decided he's not really going to be in the show ring. And I thought, you know what? Good for you. Like, it's not all about the show ring. Like no. we want people to also see your dogs just going for a walk or going to a class or going to agility or, you know what I mean? Like, there's a there's an important job for everybody within the breed. You don't have to have a show dog even to do meet the breeds, you know? Right. No, no. Not. Some of my yeah. best meet the breed dogs are not my best show dogs. Yeah. You know, and that particular person, she's a fantastic advocate, you know. That's why yeah. we went over backwards to get her a puppy. I just knew, okay, this person's gonna be good. <laughs> so you know? you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> oh, I know exactly who you're talking about. <laughs> You know, and she's just a fantastic owner that has her dogs out and has them meeting people. And she actually yeah. has two rare breeds because she's got an English Shepherd, too. Yeah, um, right, right. You know, and they just do a fantastic job with their dogs, both on social media and in person because they're yeah. just out with them all the time. Exactly. Yeah. Like, that, that's a huge, and, that's important. That's as important yes. as being somebody who's, like, showing them. Like, go out and share your dog and be happy to talk about them. Yes. You know, at the end of the day, I want my, my puppies to have great homes. And sometimes those great homes are not show homes. And maybe they're not even lure coursing homes. I, though, um, I do recommend that all people that get feral hounds consider lure coursing. Maybe go yeah. out and try it out. You know, but sometimes it's not the thing for them. It doesn't fit into their life. And that doesn't make them any less wonderful homes um, no. because you know these are the people out walking their dogs and being advocates for the breed just in their in their communities yeah exactly mm -hmm. um anybody else have any comments to add mm -hmm. so everybody should go out and get a pharaoh hound a loud chin a dandy <laughs> chin one, an american hairless terrier um no, I just think it's great we did this. I really appreciate it. I think that, um, you know, it was a big change for me to go from dachshunds, which everybody in the world knows what a wiener dog is. Everybody, you know, knows them. Everybody's, everybody's, yeah, everybody's aunt had one that bit them. You know, every, everybody's, you know, it's like you're just all over. And then I go to Lauchen and it's like nobody has them. And it's, I really enjoy talking about them to people. And also they... 
they really lend themselves to being shared with people because mm -hmm. at least mine, they're like offended if they, um, you know, if somebody ignores them, it's like, they'll scream at people like, why aren't you touching me? You know? And, um, so I'm really happy to share them. And I think it's, um, great that, um, you know, everybody has that sort of feeling that, you know, this is our responsibility. Like we have these dogs and if we want people to know why we love them and mm -hmm. especially the ones that really are in need of help, you know, um, I love the idea of like Angie wanted to do with her dogs, you know, yeah, get something that's rare that really needs help. Like there's a lot of really cool breeds that are in trouble. So if you're going to go, you know, get a dog and you're open to it, maybe look into some of these guys. And I think a lot of times the, the rare breeds are kind of the undiscovered gems. I mean, yeah. there's a lot of great breeds out there that are very low number breeds. And honestly, sometimes, you know, sometimes you find that you, you get a better a, a better dog for going with something that's not what everybody else has because you have very conscientious groups of people that are focused on trying to preserve this breed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I totally agree with you. And uh, Justice said, I've looked into four hounds, but haven't yet found someone that owns one and could tell me about them from a personal experience. So you should definitely reach out to Teresa. Yes. <laughs> um, and I'm sure if anybody posts questions on here, I'd be happy to tag um, Teresa or Kat or Sandra or Alexa if anybody has questions about these particular breeds. Um, or if, you know, if I can help with any other breeds that yes, people are looking for. <laughs> So you guys, thank you so much for doing this. I think it really gave people a lot of insight about our, our rare breeds. Thank you for having us. Sure. Yes. Thank you so much, Vicki. See you guys next time. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.